Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the second event of the Phantom and Piracy mini-series. If you joined us for our first event last Thursday when Professor Rebecca Wanzo delivered her brilliant lecture, then welcome back. And if you're joining us for the first time, welcome to Phantom and Piracy, and I hope you'll join us for the next two Thursdays as well. My name is Gail DeKosnick, and I'm the director of the Berkeley Center for New Media, which we call BCNM. BCNM is an interdisciplinary research center that studies and shapes media transition and emergence from diverse perspectives. BCNM is committed to promoting technological equity and justice. As such, our free events are inclusive, respectful, and harassment-free spaces. We do not tolerate hate speech or Zoom bombing. We will have a safety team for each event to respond to any disruptive or hateful behavior. And attendees who violate any of the community guidelines uh, stated on our website will be removed from the event and may be disallowed from future Berkeley Center for New Media online events. Before joining our events, please note our community agreements to which we will share a link in the chat. Our first value is to honor the land. We recognize that BCNM is located in the territory of Huchen, the ancestral and unceded lands of Chichenyo speaking Ohlone peoples, specifically the Confederated villages of Lashan. The history of prolific technological development in this region has always depended on this land, and all of our technological infrastructures and activities take place on and in relation to this land. We commit to supporting the sovereignty and ongoing stewardship of this place by Ohlone peoples through building long-term reciprocity and relationships with tribal leaders and organizations. We encourage attendees to explore native-land.ca, uh, the website, Our Home on Native Land, to learn about the native stewards of the land you're joining us from. I would also like to honor the Warai peoples of Leyte Island and the Lumad peoples of Mindanao Island in the Philippines, my homeland, the Tongva peoples of Shuanga, Place of the Rushes, now called Lomita, California, where I grew up, and the Mawekma Ohlone tribe, in whose Aboriginal homeland I now reside in what is called the city and county of San Francisco. Now, I'm thrilled to introduce Phantom and Piracy and tonight's phenomenal speaker. Phantom and Piracy platforms the study of new media phenomena through a queer, feminist, and anti-racist lens. By fusing the concepts of fandom and piracy together, we wanted to draw attention to the way that fandom as a community and a social phenomenon is raced, and the connections between piracy and the foundations of racial capitalism. In this conference miniseries, consisting of two lectures and two panels, taking place online on four consecutive Thursdays, we will hear from scholars whose work enables us to understand how phantom and piracy have played a part in the evolution of the internet, how they have attracted millions of participants and become akin to social movements, how they have given rise to digital platforms that both augment and defy the corporatization of media production and the web, and how race and ethnicity, gender and sexuality operate within fan and pirate communities. We are extremely pleased to host Professor Kavita Philip as our keynote speaker on piracy. Kavita Philip is a historian of science and technology who has written about 19th century environmental knowledge in British India, information technology in post-colonial India, and the intersections of art, science fiction, and social activism with science and technology. She's the author of Civilizing Natures and the very soon to be released Studies in Unauthorized Production, as well as co-editor of five volumes curating new interdisciplinary work in radical history, art, activism, computing, and public policy. She now holds the President's Excellence Chair in Network Cultures at the University of British Columbia, where she is Professor of English and Geography. From wherever you are, please join me in welcoming Professor Kavita Philip. Thank you so much, Gail. In a Zoom gathering such as this, one must in invoke, as Gail has, a broader kind of land acknowledgement. So as an incomplete but necessary gesture to my multiple vocations during this pandemic, I underscore the need to acknowledge both the histories and the ongoing struggles of indigenous inhabitants of my many lands, including those in India who are fighting the renewed expropriation of their lands, facing newly brutalized neoliberal markets. I've spent much of this time living on the land of the Tongva people in Southern California. In addition, 
I would like to acknowledge I have been institutionally based at the University of British Columbia, located on the ancestral unceded territory of the Musqueam Nation and other Coast Salish people. When Gail invited me to do a keynote for fandom and piracy online, I responded in a mirror image of Rebecca Wanzo's response that I know little about fandom and I'm poorly qualified for this honor. As she did for Dr. Wanzo, Gail reassured me. She told me that all I had to do was talk about piracy and the connections would emerge in the conversational space. I want to thank Gail for giving me the space to get into the weeds a bit. And I warn you, I'm about to dive into some legal and historical detail on a topic which has been obsessing me for many years. But I also want here to acknowledge the brilliance of the DCNM team, particularly Lara Wolf and Sophia Hussein, and the amazing panelists who are about to join us in conceiving and hosting this unique four week Thursday evening series in which new insights genuinely do emerge in the interstices between and among different forms of expertise and curiosity. Reflecting on Dr. Wanzo's brilliant talk last Thursday, it occurred to me that we both and the panelists do share a lot of common ground. Perhaps our interest in fandom and or piracy is fueled by a bit of utopian faith in the power of collaboration, mixed with an always critical historical eye on the gendered, racial, and global politics of the crowd, whether that crowd is made up of Watchmen fans claiming injury and cultural appropriation, or post-colonial pirates claiming bandwidth inequality, while searching beyond inspiring slogans for actionable ways to link our cultural consumption with an ethical politics of production and distribution. You should be able to see my screen now. So speaking of inspiring slogans, let's begin with a protest. On January 18th, 2012, the internet went dark for users of Google, Wikipedia, Reddit, and many other websites. Visitors to these pages, among the most widely used sites in the world, found a blacked out page pointing readers to information ab about an obscure US law, HR 3261. That was global amazement. This page you're looking at is from India's Hindustan Times. The LA Times said, quote, internet users in China speak admiringly of the public rebellion. Copyright law, formerly an arcane subspecialization in jurisprudence, was now center stage in millennials' public discussions. Young news anchors like Chris Hayes and Rachel Maddow discussed it on primetime TV. I'm not going to show this video now, but if you stick around until the end, we'll have time to show you. What you want to look out for is these kind of young Turk news anchors trying to figure out why their audiences needed to know about copyright law. And this is sort of a warning to you, even Chris Hayes and Rachel Maddow didn't quite know how to make this interesting. And I am going to dive into this rather dry and dull topic, but take their word for it, this is important to think about. Digital piracy, in other words, had become a headline grabbing issue. Australia-based political scientist Sky Cruiser, Writing in the tech magazine first Monday, observed that the DLM, the Digital Liberties Movement, quote, catapulted digital liberties activism into the spotlight in much the same way that the 1999 anti-World Trade Organization protests in Seattle brought attention to the global justice movement, end quote. Over the next few days, the protesters emerged as winners both in public opinion and legislatively, defeating the passing of HR 3261 into law. They were protesting US legislators' attempts to strengthen existing copyright law and managed to stall the legislators' attempt to roll out a new phase of the US-led prosecution of global piracy. So these are the acronyms I will use, SOPA and PIPA. They stand for the Stop Online Piracy Act of 2011 and the Protect Intellectual Property Act of 2011. So how did this obscure copyright issue come to be analyzed in social movement news around the world, even getting an acronym, DLM? Why did American millennials care about protecting foreign pirate sites? 
And why does this moment in US legislative history matter to our understanding of the global political economy of digital piracy? H.R. 3261, the Stop Online Piracy Act, introduced in the House in October 2011, so at the end of the calendar year, was expected to quickly and uncontroversially move through discussion and become law. Instead, the prospect of making internet censorship required by an act of law, or as the popular tech language had it, the prospect of breaking the very protocols of the internet, mobilized an opposition that was broad and wide. Corporate giants, as I've said, like Amazon and Google, but also shadowy activist groups, including anonymous, user-centric web companies like Reddit and Facebook, and a, a range of legal scholars and civil liberties experts mounted an articul articulate, well-informed, and tech-savvy opposition. So I'm going to show you a little bit of um, the act. Uh, you, can't you can't read this, I'm going to expand it in a moment, but I want you to see that the title page uh, under combating online piracy has section 1.2, which I've expanded here, uh, that talks about how to protect U.S. customers, I'm reading here from the title, and prevent U.S. support of foreign infringing sites. And jumping through the text here, how do you define a foreign internet site? to be infringing? Well, if it's owned by somebody outside the US and if US users are using it, now this is a ridiculous definition for the internet because anybody uses a site regardless of where it is, right? Depending on infrastructure, of course. And finally, if, uh, if the attorney general, the bottom paragraph here, is unable to find a person who has a US address, they're allowed to commence an action against the foreign domain name used by that site. We're gonna talk about what that means. In other words, the act would enable the taking down of any foreign website that infringed on copyright. At the heart of this attempt is the claim on sovereign power because internet technology is by design global and the information it holds can be accessed from any connected location. National sovereign rights to prosecute are weak unless these national rights are tied to worldwide powers. Frustrated with the technological inability to disrupt the global flow of information, the framers of the act hope to offer a political and legal workaround. US law would be authorized to disrupt the technical protocols by which the domain name server worked. That is, they could literally block the resolution of a URL, the process that facilitates the everyday browsing that we have come to associate with the user's access to the internet. Don't break the internet, pleaded tech-savvy legal scholars in the Stanford Law Review. SOPA may, quote, represent the biggest threat to the internet in history, they warned. Along with PIPA, the bills, quote, take aim not only at the internet's core technical infrastructure, but at, at its economic and commercial infrastructure as well, end quote. And they go on to explain to their readers, who are, of course, legal readers, what the internet's domain name system is. They call it a foundational block on which the internet has been built. And at the end of that paragraph, um, they, uh, they say this is breaking the principle that all domain name servers, wherever they may be located across the network, this is talking about geographical space and location, will return the same answers when queries re with respect to the internet address of any specific domain name that should be queried. Here we see legal scholars learning and teaching the language of technology. The numerical code that defines the location of a website is a piece of infrastructure that lies under the hood of the internet, commonly invisible to the lay users. When we type a human language address into a browser, something millions of us do every day, a complex system of organizations turns it into a numerical address that allows you to access the location you pointed to. ICANN, together with an ecology of nonprofit groups, companies, and academic institutions, manages this process. Domain name system management, which includes human and computational work, must function consistently in order for the internet to function as what the Stanford Law Review authors call the iconic infrastructure of our age. Legislating against this technical protocol was like, quote, taking a sledgehammer to the internet's core technical infrastructure, the authors argue. 
The language and technique of SOPA and PIPA hinged on the definition of foreign versus domestic infringing activities. It appeared that the framers of the legislation had hoped that its foreign tagged punitive sanctions would keep US technologists pacified. Many US lawmakers expressed surprise as the protest broke out that young American teenagers would care about foreign sites. On the one hand, this displayed a simple underestimation of the globality of the internet experiences of young Americans. But on the other hand, it was a familiar strategic invocation of the American public as naturally consuming media produced in America. The irreducibly global nature of the internet, which any network engineer takes for granted, was recognized by opponents of the bill, not because they were more internationalist in their politics, but because the technology of the internet operates in an internationalist fashion. And they followed a politics that sought to protect, nurture, and sometimes to emulate the protocols of the internet. Many of the arguments against SOPA, I'm gonna to move to the protesters now, articulated their arguments as if ventriloquizing for the internet. Last week, we won, and who's we? The internet long seen as a mostly harmless collection of kitten aficionados and porn fiends fought an epic battle of self-preservation. So the, who is it that's fighting? It's we, and that's the internet. Note here the implicit reference to fandom, right? In the kitten aficionados. Alexis Ohanian, founder, as we know, of the new site Reddit. At the time, he was 29 years old. Uh, he founded a... Uh, uh, the creation, he, he asked for the creation of the Internet Defense League, a bat signal for the Internet. Moving through other resistors, Sweden based group, the Pirate Bay or TPB, issued a press release whose location was Internet. The word Internet obviously mocks older people who weren't familiar with the conventions of naming the Internet. So this opposition, largely led by computer savvy under 30s, played on the idea that old fashioned capitalists just didn't understand technology and were jealous that libertarian computationally skilled young people were better at competition than those who made the rules. Um, so um, th this is uh, the, yeah, the uh, TPB press release, which talks about how we do capitalism better than they do. And uh, they pun on the uh, titles of SOPA and PIPA. Uh, the press release drives home their uh, critique by arguing that uh, the word SOPA means trash and the word PIPA means pipe in Spanish, in Swedish. They want to make the internet into a one-way pipe with them at the top, shoving trash down the pipe to the rest of us immediate consumers. So this is a kind of revolt of the fans, right? Assuring their readers that, quote, so far can't do anything to stop TPB. TPB is the Pirate Bay. They refer to what all computer scientists knew, that there are technical ways inherent to the Internet's own design by which to route around blocked or broken DNS links. This design was part of what makes the Internet inherently global and healing, self-healing, or you can root around a trauma or harm. So that efforts to delineate national from foreign were technically meaningless. Quote, the Pirate Bay is truly an international community, they reminded their readers, and the US, they implied, was simply attempting to destroy that internationalism. In the frenzy of discussion that followed the internet blackouts of January 18th, 2012, several different framings emerged. And I collected all of the news around that time and they fell roughly into these four categories. Freedom versus security, where the civil libertarians were fighting the national security hawks. Corporations versus people was reiterated. So uh, the Motion Picture Association of America had long waged a battle against copiers, a longer story that I tell in different parts of this longer project or legal scholars like James Boyle of Duke have long invoked the kind of uh, historical notion of enclosures versus common, referring to uh, fights over land and privatization, going back to the 18th century, and technology versus politics, as you saw, don't break the internet versus the Luddites who wanted to break our tech tools. 
and the West versus the rest. And I've obviously focused today largely on the ways in which SOPA was on both sides, both uh, old opponents of the internet and young defenders of the internet. It was about the foreigner. This domestic free speech and free use might continue to be defended by civil liberties groups, but the hope of legislators had been that an invocation of patriotism and sovereignty in the digital realm would allow them to defend US corporations by cutting off foreign sites that deployed counterfeit and illegal stolen resources. So that first section of the talk was called digital nationalism for that reason. Now moving on uh, to think about what comes after pirate moralism, uh, I'm thinking that the stigma of foreignness just didn't seem to work as well for a younger tech oriented generations because their alignments with technology made them understand internationalism without a Cold War baggage that an older generation carried into legislative work. Now, that last line is my own speculation, but you know, as you know, when anybody reaches for a generational argument, they're kind of hunting. And so luckily I have uh, other people to draw on who do more than punch. And I'm going to draw on an amazing study. Quote, piracy has become a prevalent mode of distribution for television content, announced the media studies digital humanist team of Benjamin and Gail DeCosnick and Jimmy Lee in 2017. Rather than spiraling down into the moral discourse of piracy that was common in the early 2000s, their study unveils the infrastructures that enable piracy. In a playful series of data visualizations, Dukosnik, Dukosnik, and Lee in this paper deploy a data scraping procedure to study the worldwide BitTorrent enabled downloads of popular TV shows. This one is for The Walking Dead, aiming to develop a quote, rating system for piracy. Their system shows that high population density urban areas tend to have more pirating activity than low population rural areas. Some areas show over pirating relative to their population density. High levels of piracy and relative over pirating are correlated with regions in which a global tech elite live. This rating system, which I love, takes piracy for granted as a part of the media consumption landscape and avoids many of the xenophobic and ethnocentric narratives that characterize first wave commentaries on digital copying practices. The data scraping and visualizing tool that uh, Dukosnik and Dukosnik develop enables an idiosyncratic and ingenious imaging of the internet. They track, quantify and map BitTorrent activity producing images of the world that are both familiar in that they confirm common sense ideas about piracy and the diffusion of US popular culture, as well as surprising in that they demonstrate patterns of activity that contradict 1990s models of wired and unwired nations, bright ports and dark hinterlands, and other nation-based geographic metaphors for connectivity. And I'm referring there to two decades of mapping the internet in ways that replayed first and third worlds, uh, core and periphery, north and south. Their study is more than just idiosyncratic. It has critical implications for media distribution. They write, quote, we do not see downloading activity appearing first in the country of origin of a television show. Rather, downloading takes place synchronously all over the world. Continuing uh, with their um, piece, quote, this instantaneous global demand is far out of alignment with the logics of the nation-based windowing usually required by international syndication deals, end quote. In a data-driven, tongue-in-cheek upending on, of conventional media policy, Dukosnik and Dukosnik show how over-pirating is not associated with the dark criminal spaces of the world, and suggest that the development of technology goes hand in hand with practices on the borders of legality, always happening very closely in time and space, tied with licit technological production. So the illicit and the licit are tied much more closely together. I'm gonna to go into copyright law and its interstices and come back to what's missed in the law taken as itself uh, and possibly to connect finally with fandom in our final section. But first, a deep dive into digital copyright. 
Digital copyright, Jessica Lippmann's pioneering study of how the digital revolution changed copyright law is foundational to technology and law scholarship in the US. I myself am not trained as a US legal scholar, but as a colonial historian. So a passing claim she makes about anti-piracy's origin caught my eye. She says the story of piracy or copyright starts with the kernel of nationalism and xenophobia. Initially, this piracy story was all about Americans trying to protect their property from foreigners trying to steal it. Once we got comfortable with the idea that any unlicensed use was a bad one, the evil pirates got moved off on uh, got moved on shore. Littman here is marking the origin of the copyright reform frenzy at one of those moments of recurring U.S. anxiety about global post World War II markets. She finds written into the history of copyright law traces of an anxiety about Japanese penetration into US markets in the 1980s, a fear of the power of a foreign technology silently copying and distributing US cultural products. Economic anxieties and xenophobia lie at the origins of a massive expansion of in the 80s in content control. Fear of the foreign pirate justified the corporation and the state to consolidate ever more draconian powers over the exchange of knowledge and cultural products as a way of protecting American creativity. This was happening at the precise historical moment when the internet and technologies of peer-to-peer -peer sharing were beginning to make global exchange easier than ever. This connection between anti-Japanese techno-anxiety and the origins of popular anxiety about piracy refers to a well-known case located in the prehistory of the digital age. It revolved around the videotape recorder or the VTR and its ability to make copies of television shows. In 1983, Universal and Disney attempted to stop Sony from selling its videotape recorder, alleging that it was sold and used primarily for quote, copyright infringing purposes. The U.S. Supreme Court decided against the media corporations, ruling five to four, that, quote, there is no basis in the Copyright Act upon which respondents, that's Universal and Disney, can hold petitioners, that's Sony, liable for distributing BTRs to the general public. The landmark 1984 Beta Max case, or Sony versus Universal Studios, set the precedent for the legal use of technological innovations that have since repeatedly raised the specter of new forms of, of legal and illegal copying. It was a close decision, five to four, and much of the deliberation ranged over the nature and use of this novel technology that enables consumers to accumulate a library of recordings. The unprecedented copying power that the VCR put in consumers' hands appeared to threaten studios' ownership of their intellectual property. Although Universal attempted to argue that infringing uses defined the essential purpose and existence of this new technological machine, the Supreme Court ultimately disagreed, recognizing the VCR as capable of diverse uses, not all of which were illegal. Quote, a sale of an article which though adapted to an infringing use is also adapted to other and lawful uses is not enough to make the seller a contributory infringer. Such a rule would block the wheels of commerce. The Electronic Frontier Foundation website explaining the historical Betamax ruling comments, quote, in other words, what the Supreme Court is saying is where a technology has many uses, the public cannot be denied the lawful uses just because some uses might be illegal, right? Now, if so basically film studios had seen their profits undercut by the VCR, they had attempted to block a technology they saw as inherently threatening. And if all this legalese is too complex, Jack Valenti has a simpler explanation for you. I say to you that the VCR is to the American film producer and the American public as the Boston Strangler is to the woman home alone. The quote is famous in tech circles because it appears to show that Valenti is an irrational technophobe. And indeed, Valenti remained proud all his life of the ways in which the Boston Strangler metaphor forever shaped the American discussion of the dangers of piracy. But I think, of course, that its yoking of piracy and gender violence is even more striking. Hollywood studios argument that videotape recording technology was inherently dangerous failed, of course, 
It was undercut by a still utopian 1980s faith in the productive yet contradictory connection between novel consumer technologies and economic growth under the digital expansions of capitalism in the last phases of the Cold War. The Supreme Court's majority rejected the idea that the VCR was inevitably and primarily linked with piracy, suggesting rather that something about the connection between technological change and capitalist productivity was at stake and the wheels of commerce must not be blocked. Writing on the 20th anniversary of the Betamax ruling, Fred von Lohmann summed up a familiar lesson. Quote, new technologies make copyrights more valuable because they unleash new markets and business models, end quote. Lohmann, who was senior intellectual property attorney with the EFF, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, represents, of course, the techno-entrepreneurial resistance against late media corporations, reminding us, quote, if you want a vibrant technology sector, you let the innovators invent without forcing them to beg permission from media moguls first, end quote. The gloom technological determinism of the media corporation is rejected here in favor of the optimistic determinism of the technologically driven free market. These two sides of the Betamax lawsuit were reprised in the 2005 MGM versus Grokster case, with MGM studios making arguments almost identical to those of Universal and Disney 25 years before. Uh, so lots of people followed that very closely. I'm going to skip the details, but Grokster was shut down in 2005. That case appeared to reverse the 21-year-old Betamax decision. By 2005, the faith in technology's inherently good effects on the US economy had faded sufficiently to undermine tech optimists who look for complete freedom to rip, burn, and rip. But as legal and tech commentators pointed out, the stakes were becoming higher and the battle more pitched. As MPAA President Jack Valenti was preparing to retire in, in September 2004, he was interviewed by Engadget, a technology news site. The interviewer's first question recalled Valenti's reputation for being, quote, anti-technology. Valenti immediately recognized the question as referring to piracy. He responded, quote, all of our companies are working very closely with the best brains in the information technology industry right now to see if there's some way we can deal with the piracy problem. We're trying to put in place technological magic that can combat the technological magic that allows thievery, end quote. The battle that defined Valenti's 38-year media career remained in his mind one that pitted the good guy's technology against bad guy's technology. Yet, according to legal scholar Jessica Littman, by 2004, when Valenti was still predicting that, quote, digital piracy will be far worse than analog piracy if left unchecked, the technology and law experts were already realizing that the battle was unwinnable, at least in the terms that Valenti and an older generation were defining it. Business itself had changed. The next decade would see the very terms of the piracy debate rewritten to the point where eradicating copying would almost cease to be of strategic importance to big media companies. So making copying impossible to recall included digital rights management tools that corrupted copying files, made moving digital files from one format to another impossible, enforced more difficult interoperability standards as opposed to better interoperability that tech companies were going for and so on. Despite massive changes in copyright law favoring media and proprietary software companies, and those led to ludicrous lawsuits against grandmas and teenagers for singing happy birthday or sharing articles like the tragic story of Aaron Schwartz, uh, you probably know all of these, that explosion of ripping, sharing, collagist creativity in the first decade of the new millennium simply ignored copyright regulations. And again, I want to say this is where fandom is central. Much of that explosion was fueled by fandom. This technology wave was simply too fast and too strong for the legal punishers to keep up. Instead of stopping the wave, then media and software companies shifted their business plan. Um, to offer music, film, and even software access as a service rather than, as the 20th century had conceived them, products. We'll come back to this service versus product idea. 
Now, this all-out war on software and media pirates had lasted less than two decades. Is piracy now an outmoded concern? Although the rhetoric of anti-piracy lingers, several historical shifts happened with the unexpected result of marginalizing the concerted attack on small individualized theft. The study of exemplary individual heroic or criminal feats from the altruistic Aaron Schwartz to the cynical Dred Pirate Roberts began to fade from piracy studies and from journalism. Most commenters agreed that anti-copyright piracy and its denunciation were both heading towards being dead ends in the history of digital technology. The structural issues that had created and enabled post-colonial piracy and the xenophobia that had spurred its prosecution, however, continued to bubble under the surface. How does one study the effects of the pirate function long after the initial social movements have moved on to other fights? Pirate narratives are a glimpse into the conditions of production of our political economy, one that enables and is enabled by a form of computational technical practice that was deeply contested at the turn of the century. The pirate function is a reminder that the conditions of production of pirate narratives and technology include historically embedded systems of politics, economics, law, and culture. Technology does not have a trans-historical logic nor an inherent logic that is independent of its conditions of production. Instead of seeing pirate technology as simply an object or protocol, the pirate function defines piracy through a set of contexts that explain how it came to be, how it functions, and how it might be used, modified, or displaced. It does not displace the computational object in media theory, but it places that object in its conditions of production and use, so it's can no longer be seen as an autonomous or special media object that floats above politics. The pirate function, analogous to the author function, of course, is a set of procedures. Understanding what enables and is enabled by piracy requires a series of interrogations of what makes possible the emergence of piracy as a key issue in a particular historical period. Who can be a pirate? Who does not need to be a pirate? How does the act of piracy respond to the repressive function of the law of copyright by which transgressive authorial acts are policed? Digital piracy, which was at first ignored or even encouraged, for example, when Bill Gates called on the Chinese to pirate Microsoft Word in order that they might be brought into his market domain, it became prosecuted most vigorously only when it drew on a xenophobic fear that Asians were designing media objects and writing software more successfully and innovatively than Americans. Technological authorship was enabled by an explosion in communication technology such as peer-to-peer -peer sharing, sharing, modular software reuse, and even the simple process of copy-paste. Co-evil with this democratization in technological authorship was a legislative American move to legally prohibit the kinds of copying enabled by computational technologies after World War II. This coincidence, as I've argued, was interpreted by young European activists like TPB as evidence of a doddering ignorance of the logic of technology and by activists in developing nations as a way to prevent them from catching up with the industrialized West. But service comes after piracy. Shifts in service models for media companies, streaming, downloading, subscription services, allowing for temporally and spatially individualized consumption have capitalized on the global media markets that piracy had opened up. The difficulties in pursuing every individual copyright violation mounted, making it impossible for media companies to follow the original plan of intimidating casual piracy through targeted legal prosecution. Meanwhile, a larger, much more intractable pirate emerged, Google. The rise of Google and its free library-like services and the global mainstreaming of the culture of accessible knowledge and its accompanying social movements in the developing world, framing access as a right. So Wikimedia Foundation is like, you know, access is, is arguing for access in the developing world as a right, uh, of course, based on a business plan. All of these made for a difficult shift in the proprietary corporate dreams of the early 2000s. It seemed like the piracy explosion was part of a major shift in the culture of use of digital products. 
This was a cultural shift that media and software corporations had tried unsuccessfully to stop. As Jessica Lippmann again explains, quote, they seem to have anticipated an online world in which copyright owners would detect distinct individual instances of infringement and ask service providers to remove them individually. The explosive growth of the internet has made that view seem quaint, end quote, from Lippmann. The world the copyright owners had predicted, Littman suggests, quote, was never realistic. Modifying her historical counterfactual, I would argue it could have been a dream realized and it had massive resources of the state and corporations to facilitate their vision of a locked down media world. And in fact, India's new IT rules, imagine that again, released last week uh, and discussed brilliantly by Naomi Klein recently. However, the massive cultural shift of which piracy was a part and the unprecedented kinds of social activism that emerged from the heavy handed attempts to restrict copyright and monopolize new profits and the emergence of a tech saturated generation who aligned themselves with the interests of technology all resulted in the blocking of that copyright owner's dream. Instead of using new technological protocols to lock down their products, these copyright owners ended up creating a far greater problem for themselves. Google was an opponent that could not be vanquished by the bullying methods they had used against small pirates. As Littman observes, the slash and burn strategies of proprietary actors paved the way for the emergence of monopolistic giants forever shifting the economic landscape, as she says in this quote. Littman's work has been foundational in legal scholarship on copyright and the digital economy, but there's been less engagement with the ways in which the histories of the developing world intersected with this massive shift in US foreign policy, carrying technological proprietary concerns into trade talks and multilateral agreements, and subsequently how the shift from a development frame to a neoliberal vision of market growth, as well as new authority authoritarian nationalisms have often been enabled by big tech. This is the point that Naomi Klein made last week. So postscript as we move towards closing, the reasons for piracy's popularity and centrality in emerging market economies are embedded in histories other than the legal. And here I've gestured at the histories of fandom that undergirded that. Elsewhere, I've argued that we can identify three waves of pirate studies already. If one looks below the surface of the xenophobic dog whistles in pirate enforcement, we find, and I'm moving towards my final point here, that infrastructure is often invoked. Or uh, in other words, the, the World Wide Web as a unity or the quote unquote splinter net or a balkanized set of nationalist rules for the internet. So in the larger work, of which this is a part, I find critical infrastructure studies to be useful as a mode of analysis because of the ways it connects the analysis of cultural science with material and political economic analyses. Technological histories of infrastructure have recently been popular with technologists too, many of whom believe that this deeper truth of infrastructure is a political and that it is only in cultural narrations, uses and abuses of technology that ideology enters the picture. This is, of course, an overly simple assumption, one that relies on outdated notions of an economic base, here a technological base, over which accretes a cultural or ideological superstructure. The two are in a much more complicated relationship with each other. The materiality of infrastructure is not an escape from politics. It is a refraction of the histories that colonial historians have told. The stories we tell about the infrastructural technologies of the internet seemingly a neutral zone free of politics, are imbricated with the history and politics of national sovereignty. Through the window of sovereignty, we might now understand the revivification of 19th century notions of sedition, illegality, and consequent punishment. The spheres of culture and technology are not layered upon each other. Rather, the references to culture rely upon an often invisible production and maintenance of an infrastructure. So infrastructural technology ostensibly a neutral zone free of politics is imbricated, I would repeat, with the history and politics of national sovereignty. Both kinds of formalism then, computational formalism as well as cultural formalism, distract us from the ways in which technologies of computation 
are saturated with history and ongoing politics. And I'll end there. Thank you so much, Kavita. Are you going to play that video you mentioned? Yes, let's play that video. And what I want you to look at is how Chris Hayes and Rachel Meadow are trying to figure out what this thing is, this SOPA thing. I can't hear the sound, Lara. I'm not sure if others can. No sound. Oh, we have a very, very smart uh, web team who works on my show, and I was sort of debating this with them a little bit today, which is how important was it that it was on all of the morning shows? How important was the mainstream media? Because this has been something, as you say, in trying to cover this on television, it's been a difficult issue. We've absolutely undercovered it on this show, which is something that I regret. But it's in part because this is tough to talk about in terms of explaining it in a way that makes it useful for your viewers. That should just be seen as a challenge and not an excuse, but sometimes that is a reason not to cover it, especially when there's lots of other things going on. So could, let, let's say there was huge political news that occluded this, despite the internet protests, it wasn't going to make it into mainstream media coverage today in the way that it did. Would it still have had the same impact? I kind of feel like it would. Yes, I think it would, partly because one of the, here's one of the things I think is very interesting. We have seen new forms of protest or, or, or feedback into the political system using the internet develop over the last 10, 15 years. And what tends to happen is the, the, the method is most effective when it's newest. Mm -hmm. So the first time that members found themselves barraged with email petitions, they were like, oh my God, what's going on? All these people are freaking out. What happened was that became more routinized and they started to think, oh, this is just another email petition. So I think there's something to the freshness of the tactic. The idea that, that all these websites are, are going dark in protest, that they're getting barraged all on one day. But the only thing that it produced was calls and emails, right? right. I mean, it didn't, the, 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 but I think, didn't I think it a scale and swarm, I think a scale and swarm, it, it produced, it, it, it produced calls and emails in tandem with a barrage of press okay. that all of a sudden put them in a spot in a way that I think they're just not used to being on the spot. I mean, this is one of those bills, let's remember, this is one of those strange bills that happens on Capitol Hill where you have two interests pitted against each other and most members can freelance on them. Meaning there's not a real ideological line that's right. been drawn. Right. That's line. That's so right. you think, well, I'll just sort of cut a backroom deal and maybe I cozy up to this person or maybe I think on the merits it's this. But you don't think you're going to have to walk outside of the Capitol Hill steps or go back to your district and face angry people screaming at you. Right. And you think it's one of those inside the beltway, there's a swipe fee fight between the retailers and the banks that was identical to this in many ways. All of a sudden, you're, you're meeting in the back room, you leave the office, you walk out in the Capitol steps, and there's all these people screaming. Right. Exactly. <laughs> there's photographers, and there's people with mics, and there's people who are angry. And everybody, everybody gets really worried all of a sudden. And I think, you know, there's a lot of memos going around to a lot of members, of, a lot of staff members today, from their bosses being like, Who's, who, who, who said that it was okay that I could put my name on this, right? Exactly. right? I mean, because yeah. this was one of these things that kind of flies underneath the radar. It is comforting to know that a lot of the reaction was, I gotta read this thing. Yeah, before you sponsored it, exactly. dude. Uh, Chris Hayes, the host of Up With Chris Hayes, which is the single best show on television that is even remotely related to news. It's true. true. It's true. I'm riven with jealousy. Your show is so good. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kavita. That was amazing. Uh, a kind of, as you said, kind of amazing in its boringness to the the video. Your your lecture was extraordinary and super exciting at every turn. Um, uh, now at this point, we're going to have about 20 minutes of discussion between Professor Philip and three brilliant graduate student interlocutors, and then I'll start asking the questions that you post in the Q and A box. So please start posting questions in the Q and A box now. Okay. Our three fantastic interlocutors tonight are Lou Silo Maché, 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 uh, Vincente Perez, and Jacqueline Joe. 
Lou is a fifth year PhD candidate in the German department at UC Berkeley with a designated emphasis in film and media. She holds an MA in German literature and an MA in film studies from Ecole Normale Supérieure and Université Paris 8 in France. She is currently the co-organizer of Queer Marxism, an annual workshop gathering doctoral students from the universities of Princeton, Berkeley, and Humboldt, Berlin. Her research focuses on new media, installation art, film and video, queer theory, philosophy of media, critical race studies and science and technology studies and her dissertation from goo to dust invisible matters practices and desires in the digital space engages with questions concerning immateriality regimes of invisibility surveillance knowledge production and sensuality as they specifically shape and manifest in a post panopticon information age Vincente is a performance poet, writer, and scholar with an interest in the way that artists use narrative to resist and challenge dominant stories that attempt to erase, subjugate, or enact violence on marginalized communities. His research focuses on the ways that narrative and race work together to reproduce the realities of racialization in America. His chapbook, Blackness and Latinidad explores the liminal and simultaneous experiences of being Black, Latino, light-skinned, and a father of twins. He hosts workshops and performances throughout the U.S. with a central mission of underlining the role that narratives have in reshaping worlds, determining power, and, if used strategically, fostering connections. Jacqueline is a second year PhD student in the Department of Theater, Dance and Performance Studies with a designated emphasis in new media. She is interested in race, tourism and digital technology. Other interests include Asian and Asian American popular cultures, science fiction, queer studies and high strangeness. Jacqueline is currently completing her final year of coursework. Lou, Vincente, Jacqueline, thank you all so much for joining Professor Philip tonight. Let's start with a round of questions from each of you. Lou, will you please kick us off and ask the first question? Yeah, um, thanks so much, Gail, for introducing us. And um, of course, thank you, Kavita, for this uh, amazing and dazzling talk. Um, I know I was very excited um, to participate in this conversation. And this, you know, uh, talk is a confirmation of um, of that. So I, um, I think I would I would love to ask you to speak a little more about that postscript, what came at the end, um, um, and particularly the trope of invisibility, uh, right? So your postscript is on infrastructure and the invisible hand of politics and. Um, you know, like it seems like you are maybe um, sketching here um, like a new methodological aim. I've seen in other works you've had a genealogical method here. You seem to say that um, there's something to be brought to, uh, you know, maybe post pirate studies or um, um, service um, studies that, um, you know, um, can be supported by the work that has been done on infrastructure and maybe, you know, that. Um, especially, you know, when you're speaking of often invisible production and maintenance of in infrastructure. And I'm interested in that because, I um, mean, for personal reason, because I, I do work on invisibility, but also since you also started the talk with motifs of invisibility and, you know, obscurity and suddenly, you know, the internet going down and we're all in the dark and, um, yeah, I know you work uh, marvelously with metaphors, and so I was wondering if you could say more to to that whole network of images. Yeah, I love that question. Thank you, Lou. Um, Gail, should I take the questions individually? Okay, great. Um, so yes, you're absolutely right. Uh, my earlier work has been genealogical, influenced, of course, by my historical training and also by Foucault, who I um, implicitly cited uh, there in the author function analogy. Um, I take the uh, um, theorizing about infrastructure from many people, but most especially from Lee Starr, who thought about it in a feminist sense. Um, and she talked about infrastructuring as a verb, as putting in the background or making invisible, much like the history of feminine or feminized labor. 
And I see service labor, obviously, in a kind of new global economy as following the infrastructuring or feminizing of labor. As we see, I mean, you know, the classic example in labor sociology was uh, nurses from the Philippines, right? Uh, that the, the care labor was an export, was a primary export of a nation. But we see this now all over the world, especially since the 2008 crash. I mean, we've seen um, this is this is the experience uh, in the U.S. for a broad majority of even sort of white middle class kids who grew up thinking they would have a better life than their parents are seeing that they can work in the gig economy. You know, something that had formerly been thought of as a third world black and brown population in the first world is now seen as a kind of future of work, the gig economy, a kind of economy that relies on service labor. And for me to understand service labor needs not just a sociology of knowledge, but an understanding of infrastructure. So platform capitalism is enabled by these kind of peer to peer based platforms that allow you to be an Uber driver and never see another worker, right? This fundamentally changes the kind of work. Uh, you know, if, if you take a kind of classical 19th century labor union, shop floor organizing, you meet each other, you're not invisible to each other. So to me, this kind of invisibility to each other and the invisibility to theorists who don't see our labor when we're infrastructured makes all the difference to thinking about the future of work and the future of capitalism. Mm. Awesome. All right, uh, there's so many great thoughts there, but let's keep rolling with more great thoughts. Vincente, please jump in. Hey, Professor Philip, thank you so much for being here to speak. It was a phenomenal talk. Um, I was wondering, you, you kind of mentioned um, the, the question that helped you think a little bit more about um, this from a genealogical perspective and that the question from Foucault is what is an author? So you add to that, you know, what is a pirate? I'm wondering if we could think about that in relation to fandom. Like, um, for example, how can what you describe as the pirate function work to define things like appropriate technology use along racial, sexual, and gendered lines? I'm kind of thinking in this manner, like who is the assumed pirate and who is considered the appropriate user? Or, you know, another way, who is allowed to be a pirate in creative manner versus maybe a criminal one? Oh, what a brilliant question. And here I, I would definitely call on Gail and people from the audience. Dr. Wanzo, I know is in the audience. I would love to make this a collective discussion, but let me try to jump into that because listening to Dr. Wanzo last week was definitely a kind of spurring me to think along these lines already. And I think we, one can ask that question, who gets to be a fan? And, um, you know, I, I think you and Lou are both re referencing implicitly my 2005 piece, but for those who haven't read it, you know, I talked about how, you know, um, sort of paragons of the creative commons, people who, who supported and advocated for the peer-to-peer -peer sharing economy, always came down to seeing those young white boys in elite university dorms, you know, and dorms are important because you have that high speed internet, which you might not have at home if your parents can't afford it. But it was that university setting that created the creative rippers and rippers, right? So to rip or something, to riff on something, to combine things, to play with uh, music, software was in Lawrence Lessig's mind, the place of these kind of white boys in Harvard or MIT. And when it came to Asian pirates, including in that Forbes uh, cover story that I showed briefly, oh, these were just Chinese copying things without any creativity, right? And you see over and over again, when the non-Western pirate is invoked, whether it's China and the idea that Chinese are just creating cheap knockoffs, whether it's India and Wired Magazine had lots and lots of uh, special issues on outsourcing, the, of, of data entry, the idea that data entry is just dumb work. And so you could give it to those people over there, you know? So, so the sense of geographical spatialization of creativity versus copying, even when they're using the same infrastructures and the same technology is what clued me into that genealogical um, kind of function of the pirate, uh, of, the, of who you call a pirate and who you call a creative mixer. But I'd love to hear more from Gail, because um, Gail and Rebecca. Mm -hmm, yes, mm -hmm, Rebecca mm -hmm. says the construction of productivity is too narrow in fan scholarship. Absolutely. Who can get to be a fan 
uh, and who is only uh, a copy. I wonder, Gail, in yours and Benjamin's uh, piracy, down the download pieces, I mean, what you mm -hmm. do is show us that there are fans everywhere, right? I love the everywhere. kind of, right? But the universality of the fan subject. Can you say more? And the the universality of the fan subject and the pirate subject they are they are the same you know in many countries they're the same person because of course how is a fan supposed to get the object of their fandom when it's not going to be legally aired in that country or released in that country until uh, you know weeks or months or a year or more after it airs in, or is released in the United States so of course like the you know this is sort of like the cultural imperialism wars of the cold war era when the u.s was you know the state department used to fund jazz musicians to basically tour global south countries and promote yeah. the idea of aligning with the u.s politically through u.s culture and of course like they the u.s had many actually deliberately explicitly imperialist projects that were also worked through cultural imperialism like in my country the philippines and puerto rico and hawaii you know like all of the u.s's imperialist projects have been carried out explicitly with the imposition of american you know especially hollywood culture or music cultures as the best culture in the world. And now in the age of peer-to-peer, -peer, I feel like that cultural imperialist project, I don't, it's not backfired. It, it is, you know, stronger than ever, but it sort of in a way works against U.S. interests because um, people are now so well trained by the 20th century Cold War era to be fans of um, something like the Marvel Cinematic Universe that there's no way they're going to wait even, you know, like even 24 hours, like even two hours. So, um, yeah, I think that the fandom, which I sometimes have written about as forced fandom, the forced the the fandom for American media productions that America has forced upon the rest of the world, um, you know, has resulted in a situation where the network is fast, uh, immediate, instantaneous, and uh, I think most fans understand themselves to be in a in a totally synchronous relationship with each other. Nobody on Twitter wonders like, what are these people from Australia doing in this? Twitter feed, you know, like this episode's airing right now, and it's definitely not airing in Australia on legal channels, but nobody asks that on social media. Everybody just kind of assumes that literally everyone everywhere gets the album at the same time, watches the show at the same time, gets the movie at the same time. So I think there's something interesting about the fan pirate figure uh, being a global figure, you know, that is both born from this cultural imperialism, but also kind of like Re responds to it in a in a in a in a in a way that like um doesn't attend to the needs of empire let's say doesn't center the needs of empire but rather centers the needs of the of the fan pirates their needs come first not the needs of the american empire you know even if the relation is quite is was set up by by imperialism uh, Vincente, thank you so much. That was, uh, you know, I, I feel like we can go much further with that question too. Let's hear from Jacqueline and uh, then maybe we'll have a little more conversation, a few more questions from you. Okay. Hi, thank you so much for your talk, Professor Philip. I think that, I mean, I have a lot of questions I wanna ask, but I think I can sort of continue this thread where we're sort of connecting your talk with last week's lecture and the sort of general topic of fandom. And this kind of feeds off Gail's comments about like pop cultural soft power, basically. So there's a lot of attention in your work, both in your earlier essays and in this talk regarding the Betamax case to Asian-ness, right? And the threatening figure of the Asian pirates specifically. And I think for me, um, there's a question here about the relationship between piracy and the relatively recent global popularity of some Asian popular cultures, which is where fandom comes in. And, you know, just for the audience here in my background, I have a flag from the popular anime One Piece, which is about pirates of the seafaring variety, uh, which I purchased from a random unauthorized third party seller. But the point being, uh, while I think this sort of stereotype of Asian sameness that you address is applied to most, if not all Asians, it's applied in different ways. And those ways don't always manifest in anxieties around theft and copying, right? So there are Asians who copy to whom we attribute an immature culture of copying. And then there are Asians who produce culture that is so good it merits being copied. 
right? I'm thinking in particular of the current power of the Japanese and cult uh, Korean culture industries in producing pop culture that is good enough to be pirated and American pop cultures incorporation of these things, right? So in your talk, you bring up the sort of anti-Japanese techno anxiety of the Betamax case in which we have this object created and sold by a quintessentially Japanese company that when it mixes with the general anti-Japanese sentiment of the 1980s, ends up being posited as this inherently piratical technology tied in with Japan's economic rise and encroachment into American culture and economy. But now it's completely different, right? Japanese cultural stuff isn't seen so much as piratical, it's seen as in danger of being pirated. And we have an anime industry, particularly an American one, that is fiercely anti-piracy. So the sort of general question I wanna ask here is how we see pop culture and cultural production and soft power and particularly the rise of certain non-Western popular cultures fitting in with changes in the Western understanding of the racial character of piracy. Yeah, great question. I love the good enough to be pirated. I love that phrase. Um, absolutely. Uh, and, you know, in sort of going from decade to decade, I wanted to highlight how much the 1980s are different from our current moment. And really, I wanted to uh, sort of pose that question, like, is it even worth thinking about piracy now? Very seriously, like, you know, the question of piracy is over. And in some sense, that kind of xenophobic attempt to push through SOPA was the last gasp of a kind of 20 year history. Right. So it went from about the 1980s to about 2012. And I wanted to show that Chris Hayes, Rachel Maddow thing, because, you know, you can see Rachel Maddow saying, I don't know how to talk about this. Like, you know, what did we say about this? Because in a sense, you're absolutely right. The cultural discourse has shifted. And this is supporting Gail's point that the fans are saying, look, this is just we're not going to accept the imperial framing of this problem. We're not going to accept a kind of global North, South, Asian, West framing of the problem. We're going to you know, just put out this creative stuff and we know that fans all over are going to want to consume it. So you big media corporations, you ignore our creativity at your own risk. And I, that's what for me, good enough to be pirated evokes. That is who can ignore this cultural production. Right. And but at the same time, I don't want to end the story there either, because it's not just a happy story of fans and the public winning over a xenophobic top down out of date generation. Right. That's why I kind of, you know, uh, poked fun at myself for just like pointing optimistically to this next generation. That's so cool, because if, if you picked up the ways that I wanted to read even the defense of the Internet, or in this case, the defense of creativity, K-pop, Japanese, anime, uh, the ways in which these are defended and circulated rely on the new infrastructures of capitalism. And I think even as we move into this new phase, I want to pause before we celebrate and ask, what are the infrastructures you know, that we are now forced to put ourselves in? So you know, the service economy and platform capitalism is one, Maybe there are other infrastructures of consumption that I want to hear from the folks who study fandom on the other side of this conference to think together about the ways in which there are new constraints and striations around how commodities circulate in the culture industry. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, let's do, uh, let's actually introduce some of the uh, audience's questions. Uh, I know that the interlocutors could ask more of their own questions too, but you know, let's, uh, let's invite the audience to come in and play with us also. Uh, one of the questions uh, from somebody who's uh, staying anonymous is, um, you know, I was wondering where you think uh, uh, the next great SOPA PIPA-esque fight will take place and what we can do about it. On one hand, this person writes, I think of how big social networks already control some levels of the internet today. And, uh, and they write on the same hand, I also think about uh, the firewalled censored internets uh, either developed or developing in uh, China and India. Uh, what do you think about the, the next great um, landmark case? Well, thanks for that question. I think it's, uh, it's um, the new IT rules in India. I absolutely uh, agree with Naomi Klein when she said, this is the new fight. Um, 
And to, to your point about the kind of what you're referring to, the balkanization of the internet, also referred to as splinternet by some commentators. And I briefly glossed over that in my talk. And I think that uh, the kind of foreign, uh, the fear of the foreign pirate, the xenophobia that we saw in the US law in SOPA and PIPA is uh, articulated a different way when Indian internet laws are articulated as ways to stop sedition, to defend the sovereignty of a nation that is trying to advance and progress on the global sphere. And then we have media corporations, malicious journalists in this new narrative, uh, trying to demean or make India look bad in the eyes of the world. So again, it's a global stage. You know, the internet infrastructure that we use for media production has given us a kind of global distribution that no nation can ignore. And this is where I think we need a new way to understand what we think of as the global south. So taking Jacqueline's point about this kind of big categorization of the Asian as being kind of obsolete, I think also that the global south is obsolete for us. We have to think in more fine grained terms about nationalism, new forms of authoritarian anxiety about how you look on the global stage and the role of the media, not just big media corporations like I was citing Universal and Disney, but small bloggers, you know, uh, small independent journalists, um, podcasts, uh, small video productions that do uh, news. We've seen an explosion of that. And that's where the political critique gets generated that's really threatening to certain kinds of authoritarian governments. This is not all the global South. This is not everywhere uniformly. So I think really our old models of South, North, West Asian really don't work. But I think that we need to look at the new internet rules. We see almost the same language being used. People are, are saying about the Indian IT rules that between February 25th and the end of May are going to roll out and be in force. People are saying this will break the internet. And I was so amazed preparing for this talk and going over my old SOPA notes and seeing exactly the same language used with the Indian IT rules. So I think that the new fight is upon us as of this week. So, yeah, I mean, so many fights, right? It's like the, the fights will keep rolling out. I mean, if we know anything about technology they'll be they'll come down the pike faster than than we can even count them um yeah i i feel like we'll we'll never run out of the fights <laughs> for sure uh all right brewster kale um founder of the internet archive who will be one of our panelists at the piracy and capitalism panel in two weeks says music wars seem to be over but journal publishers and book publishers are suing universities and libraries and forcing enclosure and drm digital rights management any predictions well well brewster thank you for that question i'm your biggest fan I saw what you did with the pandemic library. I loved it. I really supported it. And I hated the way in which um, it got so much pushback from publishers. Um, I'd like to hear more from you about that. And I'm looking forward to your panel. Um, I think, again, uh, the fight for sort of universal access to published material is really important. And I think the innovations are going to come from small platforms. Now, Platform capitalism, I've just critiqued in response to Lou's question about labor. And I think this is the thing about these new technologies that we saw with the, the Pirate Bay's articulation of the internet. They can go any way. And the, the politics of infrastructure are not neutral. They're not behind culture and politics. They're a long way. So I don't know, but it's going to look like publishers using new platforms to get around to work around these kind of very aggressive copyright laws. Um, that's all I can say. I don't know. I'm watching that space and I'm watching what you're doing, Brewster. I think what you're doing is some of the most exciting stuff in that space. We're all watching what Brewster's doing. And, you know, I think that there are large scale infrastructures being done by non-governmental actors like Brewster and Internet Archive and like a lot of fan archives 
also uh, and fan platforms and communities that are the they are the infrastructure. Um, they are the they they point in a direction that infrastructure has gone for about twenty years, but is going more and more to the point where uh, fan archivists will say this that a lot of young digital users cannot distinguish between like really well funded corporate digital infrastructure. Uh, and, you know, sort of fan and pirate made, you know, sort of volunteer hacker made infrastructure. Um, and sometimes this like comes into a conversation about like, where do you get your news? You know, are you getting it from just some random vlogger? Or like, is that an actual organization? You know, is that Vice News or something? And uh, I, so I think that there are all these different infrastructures of different scales and different amounts of resources and different perspectives that are really coming into play right now that is so interesting. Okay, uh, Mark Stewart from New Zealand asks, uh, piracy is often evoked as a form of activism with suggestions that it may have post-colonial power and so on. However, a superficial look at mainstream piracy sees a replication of top-down media distribution. It's easy to pirate Marvel, much harder to access indigenous in, or and or independent media. How do you see the connection between piracy and activism today? Yeah, thank you for that question. I completely share your uh, skepticism and I think uh, this is how I, I think I link to Rebecca's skepticism about certain kinds of fandom and cultural appropriation discourses that she, she picked apart in great and nuanced detail for us last week. Um, and I, of course, as Gail knows, was drawn to piracy in, in what I would call a kind of first wave of piracy studies in which we were interested in the potential for piracy to challenge, um, you know, capitalist forms of, of singular property, right? So, so sort of single ownership of property, a certain kind of commodified notion of knowledge, right? And that was the first wave of piracy and I include Lawrence Lessig and sort of standard creative commons theorists and that. Then there was a second wave of piracy and I showed the title of that book, Post-Colonial Piracy, that full disclosure, I was a part of that. I have a chapter in that. I was part of the second wave of piracy that said, oh yeah, there's this thing called post-colonial piracy and it's pushing back on the racial stereotypes of you know, the first group. And then we had a kind of third genealogical uh, you know, approach that Lou has referred to as well as Vincente uh, in which we said, well, let's, let's look at the origin of this notion of the pirate function. And I referred to that in that section of the talk. I think going forward, you're absolutely right to point to uh, indigenous art. I mean, do you really want to pirate indigenous art or do you want to work with indigenous communities to distribute in ways that are ethical? And I think what we're all looking for, of course, is both a critique of the way that capitalism is so flexible and constantly morphs itself to incorporate the things that people on the margin are doing so that the challenge of pirates was not only suppressed and subdued, but incorporated into these service models that we all participate in now, Hulu and Netflix and Pandora and Spotify, right? I mean, their idea is that business plan works because pirates existed and created the space for peer-to-peer -peer music sharing or movie sharing, right? So uh, I don't know, I don't have a template for what should come next, but I think that if we ask the questions through an understanding of labor and capital, then we will get to a more ethical, you know, version of it than capitalism will. But you can be sure that capitalism is working on a next next business plan. So mm. yeah, let me just leave it at that. Uh, that is for for the group to answer. Uh, I don't think mm -hmm. I have an individual answer. Mm -hmm. I would love to hear the interlocutors jump in on that question of what do you think about piracy and activism, by which I think Mark means more than activism, but, you know, larger projects, anti-racism, um, you know, uh, feminism and um, indigenous rights. And, you know, it's sort of like that that first wave question of utopianism, like what do, what do the interlocutors think about piracy and utopianism or dystopianism or anything in between? Um, I guess, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, just jump in quickly here because it, it, it makes me think of that moment um, 
when, you know, like you shared with us this quote um, by the, the Pirate Bay saying, you know, uh, we've done what they did. We circumvented the rules they created and create our own. We crushed their monopoly by giving people something more efficient. And I guess that's the first thing I think about when, when trying to think of the pirate as activist. I also think of like that other, um, uh, that other moment where the pirate um, can like respond well, exactly with uh, the language of the oppressor, quite literally, and um, and that that doesn't seem like a well, or rather, this is a clear moment where, yeah, it it, it it's it's a complicated um, parallel to make, um, um, yeah, because then they all the the yeah, I, I'll stop there, but yeah, I totally agree. <laughs> I, I agree with you, uh, and I think I refer to it as a kind of techno entrepreneurialism. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, you know, uh, we we all know that that uh, embedded in the day, uh, embedded in this kind of incredible resistance uh, is a kind of libertarianism, right? That doesn't see themselves as part of this kind of capitalist flexibilization of the way we consume media. So the Pirate Bay you know, is part of the expansion of capital, it only wants a more efficient or more bottom up expansion of capital. So I think you're right, what we want is something slightly different. But, um, you know, what that is, I really think it's articulated collectively. And I, I like Gail's point that, that we point here to anti racist organizing, the incredible work of, you know, BLM and the collective, there have always been anti -po uh, police brutality protests in this country, but they've been small. You know, that if you go to the American South, the kind of protests against the KKK were, were consistent through the 80s, this time we're talking about, but they've only grown because kind of model of collectivity and mutual aid uh, and care that refuses to commodify care in the way that capitalism does. All of these kind of revisiting of the fundamental categories of how we act, how we care for each other. I like to think about that as the new model. Uh, I'm not sure that piracy itself properly conceived is going to be the new model. I think it's these broader spheres of collectivity. And that's what I meant when I opened by saying, I think Rebecca and I share a real interest in the utopian power of the collective here. Vincente or Jacqueline, do you wanna jump in on this? Is it cool if I jump in Jacqueline? All right, wonderful. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. This is really a great conversation. I think what I'm thinking about now and thinking about the pirate function and this conversation of like, what do you do in terms of activism? I'm thinking a lot about like Andre Brock's work, like thinking about like distributed blackness and let me see if I can pull it here. Mostly in that we're adding in this conversation where in your postscript, you talk a lot about, uh, uh, you point to this, I believe, is that we need to think more about, you know, these, the way these things are in, actually like, you know, coded into the work itself and that these are not apolitical situations. I think along with figuring out what the pirate function is and figuring out if it can be an activist is kind of just trying to figure out a way we can incorporate the libidinal economy and other perspectives of what actually is going on, even when we're trying to say something is economic or something is about capital and something is about being shared. Um, so I think what I'm learning about in terms of what, act, what pirate activism can be, from, if you look at the you know, a libidinal economic perspective, it's really trying to ask us to think about what are the desires behind the way people are engaging with these processes? What's the way, what are these figures, you know, these figures of a, of a racial pirate doing to the mind to make us think that certain users are normal and creative with the way that they um, engage in certain actions. So I think just along with like being an interlocutor, I think part of what I'm trying to do is like answer it while also pointing to the texts that are telling us like, it's really about if we're gonna be clear that pirating is happening, we also need to think about like the, the, the actual function. So like what is happening here is that, you know, black technoculture hacks the logic of capital accumulation. It hacks the logic of the way racism and anti-blackness is coded into these um, social media platforms and 
hides in plain sight while talking to only some people who can understand. So I'm thinking a lot about that. And I'm wondering if I can ask the question also is, is like with social media, like um, I'm thinking a lot about like TikTok and sounds and the reproduction of sounds. Like, are you, uh, Professor Philip, like, have you seen social media platforms like TikTok, Instagram, or Twitter kind of changing the stakes of intellectual property itself? Is there some kind of sense that we can come through? Maybe this is the pirate function in action. In, can we come to some kind of sense of a communal stewardship? Or, you know, is this fandom itself? Or, you know, are we, getting, are we gonna get this through social media? What are your thoughts on that? That is such a great comment, Vincente. So, so many things there. I think your first point, uh, I love your bringing in Andre Brock, Distributed Blackness. And in fact, um, not this is not a book pitch, but you just made me think about that book behind my left shoulder. And that is exactly where the impulse came to work on that book. That is an edited collection called Your Computer is on Fire. It ships on March 9th, so next week from MIT Press. And that is exactly the project there, to look at the ways in which a racialized gendered landscape is engaged with by computational capitalism and also the ways in which all of us are pushing back. So ab absolutely, I think activism is one way of talking about the collective and distributed agency. I think your note, note about the libidinal economy reminds me of Mitali Thakur's chapter in that book, which it's called Capture is Pleasure. And it talks about the way in which our desires are, are um, affected by this kind of notion of identifying people on screen. And you can think about what a child or a young teenager does when they're identifying their friends on Facebook, data labeling for facial recognition, data sets to teach uh, you know, computational systems to get better at this thing, which is essentially a tool of surveillance go all the way to January 6th when all of us were riveted by this massive outpouring of video. And the first thing that was said is, oh, we have so much video, we can arrest all these people, right? And so we go to their homes and arrest them because we have this, this we've been tutored in gaining this pleasure from identifying facial patterns, right? And of course, you know, uh, there, there's a kind of reversal of those targeted by facial surveillance and police systems and those that, that, that uh, the January 6th insurrection captured. But you see, I think what you're calling the libidinal economy of recognition here. Uh, so I think, again, I want to say again and again that we're not, we've not left with the formalism, right? We, in the 1970s, when Donna Haraway wrote Cyborg Manifesto, she was pushing back against feminists who said, tech is not for us, tech is inherently masculinist. I think at this point, 50 years later, we can't say that tech is inherently anything. So that's why it's up to us to form the terms of the collective and not to leave out the infrastructures of the collective. We cannot just take infrastructure off the shelf. Infrastructure is something that's built along with building relational selfhood. Yeah, for sure. Gosh, there's so many things to say about that. <laughs> like so many, so many thoughts. I mean, you know, like one thing I feel like Vincente and I have been talking all semester in preparation for uh, his upcoming QEs about uh, locating a lot of um, strategy and power in Black remix cultures. Uh, and the and what Vincente just alluded to about um, having you know double languages inside a lot of black remix, which is like only certain people are going to even recognize these sounds. Um, only certain audiences are going to even respond to what is being remixed here and what the mix of these differences are in this new work, you know. Um, and so there's quite a lot of you know research meaning like artistic research, like art as research, that's been done already to kind of unlock the activist potentials of piracy and fandom working together, which I consider an art like sampling and hip hop to definitely be one of those thick themes of art research, you know? Um, and it's, it's just interesting to think about how little, uh, we, how little sort of like even academia understands about 
about that research yet, you know, still. Uh, but definitely um, Brock and uh, your genealogical line of thinking, um, you know, they're definitely fan scholars working in that space in that book, Postcolonial Piracy, too, that, like, allow us to start to unpack, like, what is going on in the copy and the mix? It's not just wanting TV shows, you know? <laughs> There's, like, something's happening there, but what that is, is um, both particular to individual bodies and spaces and places and, and also like really collective in these massive agglomerations of like mass media audiences in ways that we can't really, um, I don't think we have like a very robust vocabulary for um, even talking about what the, what the pirate activism is, you know? Um, because some of it, as Vincente is alluding to, is just like kind of purely affective. It's like getting people to feel together or getting people to feel a certain way about even like a certain mo part of cultural history, um, like the way the 90s and Public Enemy or Eric B and Rakim are mining the 70s. Uh, you know, I think there's, you know, there's been work on that. And there's like these moments of culture that flare up and then become a collective body of work for people to kind of express themselves through and think think their ways through contemporary problems through. So, okay, that is just, if anyone wants to jump in, that's great. If not, I am going to go on and ask more questions from the audience. All right, uh, Syria Mohan says, wondering how Professor Phillips sees ongoing efforts by platform companies to develop algorithmic copyright infringement, discovery slash filtering infrastructure to stave off further regulation. How would you characterize these interventions in relation to policing fandoms and creative reappropriation? Or are they merely ways to ensure that platform power doesn't get curtailed more comprehensively? I mean, I'm really interested in that. I guess I don't even know exactly what this question is alluding to. What think, are the ongoing yeah, efforts? Yeah, I to think develop, I know. Yeah. Thank you, Sri Ram. Yeah. <laughs> love it. And I mean, I would love more from Sri Ram if I'm getting it wrong, but I think there's two parts to this. One is regulation and the other is automation. So absolutely, the big media uh, and tech corporations are terrified of regulation and they are making moves to do a little bit, you know, it feels to me like corporate social responsibility in response to activists talking about how corporates destroy environment and things like that. So CSR came in for that. So you're absolutely right. They're like, look, we're taking it down. So YouTube will just, you know, do a kind of automated takedown notice and then just take stuff down. Um, and I think that's what Sriram is referring to, ways in which there doesn't have to be a lawyer sitting there checking all of, uh, you know, the things that you upload to YouTube, that, that YouTube can check it against copyrighted material, you know, do, do a simple A, B test and then take it down if there's too much of a match, kind of like, uh, the plagiarism detectors in, in professor software do, like turnitin.com, right? So there's a kind of automation possible. And I think you're absolutely right, Sriram, that it's big companies uh, avoiding stronger regulation. But I think there's another part of your question that's uh, really interesting, which is, uh, does automation work? And again, to point to that book behind me, Sarah Roberts has got a great chapter on automation and in fact you know she's looked at content moderators uh and she's emphasizing that the things we think are automated like uh, like horrible disturbing content on facebook being taken down by somebody who's who's looking at it right this, these can never be fully automated and there's always somebody who's being traumatized by watching you know uh hideous child porn or murder or you know uh very very disturbing content and having to take it down so you and I don't have to watch it. So I also want to take apart that automation point and say that automation is always both machinic and human. And so I would push back on those companies, not only around the regulation problem, but around the automation issue. And you know, the usual things that copyright activists will bring out, of course, is that automation is gonna get lots of things wrong. And so you're gonna be taking down a lot of legitimate stuff. So my final point on that, is this reminds me of the book by Brunton and Nissenbaum called Obfuscation uh, that I teach in my undergrad class. And they, they point to various ways in which you can obfuscate uh, attempts to grab your data, to you know, track you, and there's lots of things we do. 
But this, I think, is obfuscation on the part of corporations. They're, they're just messing up our life. You know, here we are as fans, global fans, as Gail has been saying, sharing, putting stuff up, having things viewed, watching, as Jacqueline said, K-pop and anime and like avoiding the standard methods of distribution. And here comes a corporation taking stuff down in this frenzy and telling us we're not allowed to do it. They're kind of obfuscating our kind of global fandom experience. So I feel like they're, they're throwing sand in our gears, in other words. They're, they're using tactics taken from a history of activism, of throwing a lot of yeah, frivolous lawsuits at us, and they, they know that we don't have the money and the time to resist that. And so this goes back to what Littman said, the only people who survive in a landscape like that are huge pirates like Google. You know, when Google does a search, they have to cache huge amounts of the web. That is a copy function. Right. And if you and I copied like that, we'd be in jail. But Google can get away with it because it's, you know, search engine technology. So I, oh, I like mean, <laughs> e just to be even more explicit about Google as uh, the biggest piracy, you know, entity, um, when Google bought YouTube, they basically did so at a time when they could throw all this money at the Viacom lawsuit against YouTube in um, 06, 07. Like YouTube may not have survived that as a like, a, as an exciting startup, but nevertheless, not a startup with, you know, a war chest of a hundred million dollars to fight legal battles against Viacom. And Google's purchase you know, it did ruin YouTube. I mean, those of us that remember early YouTube remember a really glorious pirate site where people were uploading things that were just amazing, you know, VHS tapes of soap operas from like the 1960s and just stuff from all over the world, like uh, shows from nations that, you know, like I was never going to understand the dialogue, but nevertheless, just seeing that content was so thrilling and as well as just like really kind of bad reality shows uh, that nobody was going to actually catch at one in the morning, but were, were still awesome to catch on YouTube, you know, any time of day. And so Google did ruin the, the peak of YouTube's, you know, user UX design or something, uh, just the experience of that. But like, nevertheless, it did protect the pirate site. It like protected it and defended it and grew it out to an amazing, um, well, I don't even know how what to call YouTube right now. It is a pirate site among a lot of other things. Um, but yeah, it was that it was just that money and that corporate protection that allowed a thing like YouTube, a platform like that, even to persist, you know, it needn't have persisted. And other if you think like another YouTube could have been invented, I mean, Apple threw hundreds of millions of dollars at Apple TV for many, many years before YouTube launched. Nobody had really figured that out yet. So it wasn't a definite thing, just like you're saying about SOPA and PIPA. Um, it wasn't for sure that the dream of shutting down the big pirate site, you know, couldn't have happened. Um, it could have. Okay, I'm moving on because there's so many exciting questions. Let's um, ask, uh, let's ask Carl's question. Carl uh, Mendonca. Newer platforms seem to have turned some of the debates about piracy on their head. Built on copy culture and fandom, TikTok in particular, uh, has added an interesting dimension re the geopolitical specificity of platforms and data infrastructures. It would be really interesting to hear about your analysis, your analysis of the intersection between piracy and this new but old frontier. That is a great question from Carl. Um, so I absolutely agree. You know, I think the kind of singling out of platforms based on the nation from which they come goes along with, I, I think it's new, but not new because this anxiety about sovereignty is in the discourse of piracy throughout, right? So I think that um, we see it come back into focus not a coincidence that it comes back into focus at a time of authoritarian nationalism. And I think what you're thinking about is not only the US, but India as well, right? And I, uh, I do think that infrastructure can never be just uh, a com computationally neutral thing. I mean, so I'm saying this again and again, because that is the way that we get sold it by the technologists, that this is a, a, a thing that's going to enable 
your wildest dreams. You can be a capitalist at it any way you want using this platform. And I think that what we see is, is no, you can't. You have to be a capitalist in a certain sovereign national kind of way. And so we're seeing a sort of shift of capitalism and the invocation of platforms through their national origin is a way in which lines are being drawn in a new global market. Um, if, you, if we wanted to get analogies, I mean, just to broaden it out the way that Gail and Vicente have uh, broadened out this notion of distribution, I would think in terms of the classic models of imperialism. I think that minor nationalisms, you know, always threatened imperialisms, but imperialism also turned back to minor nationalisms and incorporated them into their idea of a larger and larger hegemon, right? And I think that that's the way that, that these stories go. You know, TikTok may be threatening because it's from China, but you can have changes in CEOs. You can have sales of of companies as YouTube being bought by Google, you know, you can have these companies sort of um, taken over in almost a hostile way, but not in a purely market oriented way, a way that nations are going to shape. So I think this is just a long arc if you think about um, the East India Company and the way it played the role of a state. Uh, I think corporations and states cannot really be separated. Um, I think that corporations, I mean, we know all of the statistics about, you know, how Facebook, you know, is the economy of like five countries put together. I think that that tech companies are functioning like states. And so I'm not surprised that the rhetoric of sovereignty is constantly invoked again and again. Yeah. Totally. Gosh, that's sad. <laughs> it's sad in a way that uh, as you've been talking, and I know you work on historical seafaring piracy too, um, how little has changed or has mu how much is repeating from the era of, um, of seafaring piracy, you know, the fact that we have new East India corporations uh, or new East India companies. And another thing that occurs to me is how piracy, not all piracy, but some, some key pirate actors were legalized as privateers and became agents of the state uh, because, you know, the, the nation states, the, the, the empires could clearly see the advantages that piracy offered, the efficiencies, the technological innovations, the innovations and in repertoire and, you know, just like motivation of personnel uh, as opposed to the British Navy and stuff like that, you know. And so, like, just as you were saying, the streaming platforms built their, you know, built their their markets on the back of uh, pirates innovations and research. Uh, and in some sense, legalized piracy because so much of pirate thinking, I mean, Spotify just start straight up, I think, started as a pirate site, you know? So it's like, because the, the research of pirates is in Spotify, is in Netflix, and, and because it's in Netflix, is in every streaming platform right now, um, you know, there's a way in which that privateering move has been already made in uh, digital media piracy. Um, yes. It's all, you know, the world just turns and turns. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, um, yeah, you're absolutely right, Gail, about this having an analogy to privateering. I, that's exactly why I went back to the 17th century. And I don't want to take too much time, but just Captain Kidd is a great example of that. Captain Kidd is a privateer. He has a sponsor. or um, And then the sponsor betrays him at the last minute because there's a kind of expediency to hanging Captain Kidd. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Uh, okay, great. Um, oh, question. yes, Jacqueline, great. I, this is interesting because like this question, this discussion kind of begs the broader question for me, like under what conditions do conversations about piracy rouse some sort of like technological cosmopolitan affect like with the SOPA PIPA thing? And under what conditions do like piracy anxieties result in this sort of like racist xenophobia we see sometimes, right? Like since I'm sort of a, one trick pony regarding Asia. I'm thinking particularly of concerns with data security in Zoom recently, right? Which is a Chinese company now that like working from home has basically made all white collar workers like technological workers. And like, I, I feel like there might be some sort of connection to be made 
between the sort of anti-Asian xenophobia of the present moment due to the COVID-19 pandemic and anxieties around like foreign, specifically Asian threats of data theft. And like so many of the memes about this Zoom situation have pointed out like how appalled we are by Zoom's use of our data. And we're so appalled by Zoom's use of our data that we can continue like conveniently forgive and forget that literally like every other domestic tech company like Facebook and stuff are also like making equal use of our data, right? So like, that's kind of what this conversation is making me think of this like we, this sort of like unpredictable way in which sometimes it's like oh we are the world right and like we are all the internet together and then sometimes it kind of manifests in this sort of really xenophobic form yeah i think they're connected too i think uh you know just to keep for a moment your invocation of the cosmopolitanism versus the kind of xenophobic racism and then Gail's wonderful invocation of early YouTube, where I actually think what we love about that was not so much cosmopolitanism as extreme localism, right? Uh, something that is only understandable in this context. And Gail said, I might not even understand the language. What is my pleasure in that? My pleasure is not so much cosmopolitan as in something all of us approach the same way, or as much as appreciating something that's so local that I don't want it translated fully for me. I'm just enjoying its localism. And I think the kind of boom in cosmopolitanism, both as a, an academic term, which boomed in like the 90s, right, uh, is actually linked to a kind of, um, I think, class elitism, because to be cosmopolitan, one has to have a passport that crosses borders, one has to move around. You know, it comes again from a 19th century kind of gentleman who would go to the continent to take in the art, you know, it, it's a kind of very class based notion of a shared culture. And so when it's invoked by technology companies who say, look how cosmopolitan you can be with this technology, right? Whether it is Instagram or TikTok or um, Facebook or Google, right? A whole range of technologies. I, I think we should be aware of what kind of cosmopolitanism we're being sold. And keep in mind the kind of fandom desire and pleasure that Gail invoked earlier, and I think that Rebecca also invoked, I think pushes against that notion that we are all one consuming world. Um, it pushes towards a kind of localism, which doesn't result in a kind of hermetically sealed pluralism, like multiculturalism imagines us to be but it, it requires us to be rooted in some forms of local consumption that are not always translatable to each other. So that's just one little riff on your great question about cosmopolitanism. Um, but I think there's so much more in there. I'd love other people to pick that up if, if other folks on the panel want to pick up what Jacqueline said. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, Lou or Vincente. Uh, if you want to jump in on cosmopolitanism, cosmopolitanism, you know, one thing that just comes to mind really quickly is, was the Google takeover of YouTube the gentrification of YouTube? I mean, and it kind of it kind of shows like gentrification isn't about just making things nice, you know, it's about this kind of cosmopolitanism that you're talking about. It's a kind of like coming to agreement, we're all gonna value certain things in a certain way, you know, no matter where they come from. It sort of flattens out, um, you know, in a way it flattens out reception and, um, and imposes a sort of like single approach to culture. Um, I know YouTube is still pluralistic, but like it, it also is kind of broken. It also doesn't really work anymore. The way that a lot of gentrified spaces, you know, sort of purport to be cleaner and nicer and make everyone who enters the space act in a kind of neoliberal way, um, as if they're adhering to certain agreements of like what proper comportment in public is. And at the same time, it's kind of broken. It like kind of doesn't work anymore. It doesn't offer the extreme localism. It doesn't offer, you know, anything unique anymore. So there's something about that that I feel like I'm going to work through. Vincente says taste. Vincente, why don't you, why don't you go? Get, say something about taste.
Yeah, I was just kind of thinking about how um, I think I think cosmopolitanism is essentially trying to consolidate taste is trying to, you know, I'm thinking about taste, you know, thinking about taste, uh, a taste of the other. And I think that it has a sound and um, I'll just stick with sound because that's my background. I think it has a sound component that um, hip hop has always like fought against. And I think that that's my lens into this conversation. I think like hip hop and thinking about fan studies together helps me realize that um, there are codes that are um, legible, that are, you know, sonically, that can sonically register in the same way as other sounds, but can only be legible and heard um, in certain spaces. And I think that brings back the idea of the localized versus the cosmopolitan and that these spaces function so well because, wonderful, uh, these uh, spaces work so well because they work on this highly localized notion. And I think one of the ways that I'm exploring this uh, is really through like genius lyrics, like the the switch from rap genius to genius was so interesting for me because it's the idea of lyrics and also hip hop fans being able to come in and talk through lyrics and also having artists come in and describe their lyrics. You get this really interesting conversation about like, you know, is the author dead? If it's still speaking and talking and writing, if they're writing and making up the sense with us, I think that the only way I can think through that is abandoning the idea of cosmopolitanism or the idea that things can be universally understood. Like the universal subject is like, is, is dying. And I think the way Black Studies is looking at this is really interesting. And I think the way hip hop is looking at this, because hip hop is the code, you know, it's like a way of living in the world and thinking through the world. And so we can find ways through in that interpretation of rejecting cosmopolitanism, we can find ways that within hip hop, there's a way of like coding things so that it can be heard by everyone, but not understood by everyone in the same exact way. And so I think uh, the question about, yeah, cultural appropriation, that's, that's what makes it clear, like blackness can be appropriated, but it's not possible for it to actually be captured in the way that we think other things can be captured. So, you know, I, I'm excited to again, read that book too, because this idea of capture and pleasure and the libidinal economy is all what I'm gonna try to argue that hip hop has always been fighting against, but continues to, even though it's highly commercialized, um, you know, X, Y, Z problem. I think what it still has at its central focus is this idea of a local understanding. Um, and I think that that's relevant to parts of YouTube and then various other parts of platforms that can be gentrified or taken over by this cosmopolitan affect, Jacqueline. I think that that's what you just described it. And that was like a wonderful phrase because yeah, I think it's a, the push against that is where maybe the activism or the power can come from and, you know, turning these things on the head. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Jacqueline, you put something in chat, but maybe just go ahead and say that, you know? Yeah, you know, because like, um, it makes me think of the question of cultural appropriation, because it's like, when we talk about this cosmopolitanism thing, cultural appropriation is like, we often talk about it as theft, and in some way, it's kind of piracy in a cosmopolitan key, right? So it's less of a question of like, theft by the so-called developing world, but more of a theft of the quote unquote developing world's cultural resources by the American cultural industries in this case, which like goes back to something we talked about earlier is that like, you know, piracy belongs to the strong as well as the weak. Sometimes the Navy is the one doing the pirating because, you know, cultural appropriation controversies come to the fore in a big way when IP law gets brought in. I'm thinking, for example, when Kim Kardashian tried to copyright the word kimono, I'm particularly thinking about when Disney tried to copyright Day of the Dead, like the holiday, like prior to the release of Coco. And the Coco example in particular is quite strange because it almost seems like a sort of attempt to like legitimize through IP law that what this film was doing was not appropriation, but rather like rightful usage of legitimately owned cultural property or something, which completely, completely backfired. Like that completely backfired in the Disney case. Um, and so, I mean, I think it's interesting because like the question of cultural appropriation has had this huge surge in popular attention and maybe the past like what, seven, five to seven to 10 years, I don't, I don't know time, some period of time. Um, and, you know, it's kind of, interesting to think about what that has to do with larger questions of 
you know, property and copying and theft. Mm. I mean, for sure, right? Uh, Kavita, do you want to kind of like... Well, I just on? wanted I to love... emphasize yeah. how brilliant that, that, that IP is possibly a corporate response to people trying to articulate their defense of their culture, right? So it's it's like, okay, you won't let us culturally appropriate you, we'll just slam an IP, you know, <laughs> claim on your stuff. Uh, so yeah, I just wanted to appreciate how much uh, that, that works. Yeah. Go ahead, thank you. You know, we, we are within striking distance of seven o'clock Pacific. So I think we will move into wrapping this up. Uh, we have so many, unasked great questions from the audience. I'm so sorry we weren't able to get to everybody's question, um, but Kavita can see all the questions and our interlocutors can. So your questions will fill our minds uh, in the coming days. Uh, and, you know, I just want to give Kavita the chance to just maybe offer some concluding thoughts and then I'll preview what's coming up in Phantom and Piracy and then we'll say good night. Well, I just want to thank all of you, the very brilliant panelists uh, and the attention that you brought as well as your own experience with culture and politics to this talk. So thank you for all that. I've got stuff to think about. Apologies to the Q&A folks that we didn't get to. And a uh, big, big thanks to Gail, Sophia and Lara, the team that put this together. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, everybody, for coming. Kavita, for being brilliant. The interlocutors for being absolutely amazing. Um, a great audience. And let me just preview for everyone that next week, uh, same time, Thursday at 5, we have an excellent panel, scholars panel on fandom and race. And then the following week, Thursday at five, we will have an equally excellent panel on piracy and capitalism. And I sincerely hope that our keynote speakers, uh, Professor Rebecca Wanzo and Professor Kavita Phillip can come to those respective scholars panels and just, you know, weigh into those conversations. So we will revisit a lot of these topics in the next couple of weeks. Thank you all. Um, this has been great. I've really enjoyed tonight.